Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's conversation on race and policing. Uh, today, we will have a conversation with Ali Winston and Darwin Bond Graham, the authors of Ri The Writers Come Out at Night, Brutality, Corruption, and Cover-Up in Oakland. But before we begin, I would like to take this time to read our land acknowledgement. We recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, Yuha Vietam. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our guest co-host, Michael German. Thanks very much, Matt. My name is Mike, Mike German. I'm a fellow with the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School, and it's my pleasure today uh, to talk to Ali Winston and Darwin Von Graham about their new book, The Writers Come Out at Night, Brutality, Corruption, and Cover-Up in Oakland. Uh, Ali and, and uh, Darwin are longtime investigative reporters who work together in Oakland and were co-recipients of the 2017 George Polk Award for Local Reporting for their coverage of the Oakland Police Department's sex scandal uh, involving the exploitation of, of an underage teen. I met Ali when he and Darwin were covering a California-based white supremacist fight club that was committing violence all across the country uh, with little law enforcement attention until ProPublica published their article uh, and Frontline published a documentary about the group that the FBI finally laid charges. Ali is a graduate of the University of California, or I'm sorry, the University of Chicago and the University of California, Berkeley. Darwin is now the news editor at Oakland Side and holds a doctorate in sociology from the University of California, Santa Barbara. First, let's talk about the title, The Writers Come Out at Night, because uh, although that's the nickname of a particular group you write about in, in the book, it alludes to the Knight Riders of the Ku Klux Klan, and there are a lot of uh, listeners, I'm sure, who associate the Klan with, with policing in the South, but the Ku Klux Klan actually had a, a large connection to law enforcement here in California. Can you talk a little bit about that history and, and the history of o o policing in o Oakland, particularly, and in California generally? Yeah. Um, well, I'll start with the, the name, the writers that this group of police officers were using, essentially a gang of police officers in the early, the late 1990s, early 2000s, who were running around West Oakland, beating people up, planting drugs on them. They called themselves the writers. And the reason they did is because there was a story that was told within the police department kind of like a joke. And it went like this. There was one afternoon, an African American man was driving his car through West Oakland, and he was pulled over by an Oakland police officer. And the Oakland police officer walked up to the window and, uh, you know, very politely said, may I see your license and registration, calmly walked back to his squad, squad car, ran the information through the radio, came back to the man in his car, handed him a ticket, explained the process, asked if he had any questions, was about to walk away. And the man in the car said to the police officer, thank you. And the police officer was a little confused. And he was like, why are you thanking me? And the man in the car said, well, it's not like this at night around here. At night, the riders come out. And so the that story made its way back into the locker rooms of the Oakland Police Department in the late 90s. And they started telling that story. And these officers came to really adopt that person out, that, that, uh, that name, that, that moniker, the riders. We are the riders. And we, you know, ride through <laughs> West Oakland. Um, but of course, yeah, it has that double meaning. Um, and it's not clear that the officers who adopted that name in 2000 we're aware of this double meaning, 
But for the black community in Oakland, the riders, the rough riders, the night riders, it absolutely had the double meaning of like, you know, these terrorist groups who throughout American history would go through African American communities and do extreme harm, burn, burn down people's homes, bomb them, um, lynching people. In California, the Ku Klux Klan um, had its emergence kind of this, this is during the period, uh, the 1920s, the late 19 teens through mid 1920s. This is the second emergence of the Ku Klux Klan. It's a urban clan. And in California, this terrorist organization, its primary focus wasn't, it wasn't to suppress um, African American communities. Its primary focus, it was a bit more nebulous. The Klan in Oakland and much of California, they viewed their mission as upholding the morals of society against the decay that was being brought by ethnic immigrants from Europe, by Catholics, uh, by Jews, and by African Americans and, and Chinese and others. And so they viewed themselves as defending this white civilization in Oakland. And it's true that a lot of police officers up and down the state belonged to the Klan. Law enforcement was quite divided. Some law enforcement leadership was condemning the Klan's activities as acknowledging them as the terrorists that they were. Other police officers were joining the Klan and secretly um, joining into these campaigns to terrorize public officials and others who were standing up for immigrant communities and African-Americans. And one of the things that I I appreciated about the book was how you tied the the uh, political and demographic and and social and economic history of Oakland to its influence on the police department and how changing demographics uh, gave uh, sort of fueled that mission of protecting the the establishment from from new people coming in during World War II and, and after World War II. Talk about how that history influenced the police department. Sure, so it, Oakland was, you know, the city's founded in 1852. It's, you know, a city that was very heavily based around natural resource extraction and, um, and transportation. It was the end of the Transcontinental Railroad on the Eastern shore of the Bay, connects the Bay Area to the rest of the country. And, you know, the hills of Oakland were basically used to build San Francisco in the beginning of the city's history. Um, so there was a lot of money that actually that concentrated in Oakland and the city's founding fathers made their their wealth off of natural resource extraction, shipping, transportation, those, those industries, which, of course, required a ton of manpower. And in the early years of Oakland's history, there were a lot there were, you know, Anglo migrants who came uh, west um, over the Sierras, but there were also a ton of migrants who came across the ocean from the east, Chinese laborers who were brought in to build the railroads, to, you know, dynamite the passes in the mountains that would later become, you know, our roads, our, our freeways, um, to mine, to lay out the city, um, the city grid. And this, um, this Chinese population was the city's really the city's first quote unquote underclass that was um, the, the police department when it was created, when it was you know, brought into uh, being in the mid and late 19th century, their main goal was to keep Oakland's Chinatown and Chinese population in line. And they would do this, um, you know, they would throw them and throw folks in jail over labor disputes. Um, they very frequently raided the gambling and gambling halls and opium dens and prostitution um, establishments in Oakland's Chinatown. Um, there was such a, you know, rich racket that they were running on um, basically skimming and extorting Oakland's Chinatown that after the 1906 earthquake that leveled San Francisco, once the Chinese population from San Francisco fled to the East Bay, the SF cops actually would follow the Chinese to Oakland to the other side of the bay and shake them down over there. Um, but around that same time, you started to see a lot more migration to, as the Bay Area industrialized and as California industrialized, migrants from Southern and Central Europe and Eastern Europe came out West. And along with, um, you know, an influx of 
Orthodox, uh, Orthodox um, Christianity and Catholicism, which the city's Anglo um, majority didn't like at the time. And that's one of the things that helped spur the creation of the Klan. Um, they brought different politics. They brought anarchism. They brought communism. They brought more, they brought socialism to the West Coast. And the, of course, you know, you figure that a bunch of American industrialists were very, you know, xenophobic to begin with, bigoted to begin with. They see this new ideology coming in that purports to have social leveling effects and uh, they got fired up against it. So the police department really worked um, hand in glove with during the 1910s and 20s or tanned in glove with extreme reactionary organizations like the American Legion, which you can think of as like a precursor to the, the Proud Boys or, you know, the, the three percenters these days to assault um, left wing radicals and labor and trade unionists to round them up. Um, they built dossiers on them that eventually served as the uh, as the kind of bedrock as the as the building bricks for the Palmer raids that resulted in the arrest and deportation of thousands of left wingers from the U.S. in the late 1910s, early 20s. And in the you know the Great Migration uh, that World War II prompted, really changed the city's demographics for a third time. And that's really defined Oakland for the modern era up until almost the present. So the Bay Area was one of the arsenals of democracy during the Second World War. It very quickly, once the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, once we geared up for war, turned into a massive shipbuilding hub, munitions, um, a munitions or an ordnance factory. There were huge depots lining the Bay, basically from the Delta all the way down the shore, almost to... Um, San Leandro, I want to say, and tons of African Americans migrated up the railroads um, from Texas and Louisiana um, along the border up the coast, San Diego, Los Angeles, Oakland, Seattle, Portland, they all got their African American population influx during this period. And Oakland was obviously one of the has still retained a lot of its African American population from that day. But the police department and the city's founding fathers during that era they viewed the African-American population as a temporary population that would go back to the South once the war was done. And I tell you, you bring people out to the California sunshine, you give them taste of life outside of the Jim Crow South of the 1940s, they weren't going back. So the police department um, very quickly in the late 1940s started to hire folks straight off of base. Um, there was a massive army base in West Oakland. And there are other facilities around the Bay Area that also had a lot of demobilizing soldiers from the war effort. And they hired folks from the military. They did look for folks who, had, who were from the South, um, who knew how to, quote, police the, police the right way. And uh, OPD in the 1940s and 50s was so brutal and so callous and so just frankly bloody towards African-Americans that their conduct precipitated the first uh, statewide investigation of a police department for civil rights abuses and racial profiling and bias by the California legislature in 1950. And there was also a community response that, that came about in, in the decades after uh, where community members who were uh, sick of police officers uh, uh, engaging violently with members of their communities actually armed themselves to protect the community members and started following the police cars as they patrolled through the neighborhoods. Talk about the, the rise of the Black Panthers in, in Oakland. Yeah, there had always been resistance to the police department in Oakland. Um, you know, if you go back to the era when the police were shaking down the Chinese, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, there are mentions in, you know, newspaper articles at the time of um, some of the uh, Chinese owners of different establishments were trying to retain attorneys to defend themselves against the police. Later on, the uh, left-wing labor radicals who were being just brutally assaulted by the police having their uh, meeting halls raided and yeah being you know thrown into jail and uh, dep uh, deported by the federal government they also pushed back against the police but what happens in the 19 really the 1960s um, is a whole new level of resistance the black population in Oakland um, really pushed back in a way no one had had quite seen yet. Um, so the most you know famous example being the formation of the Black Panther Party, which is 
you know, created by these young, rel relatively young, uh, uh, Newton, Huey Newton and Bobby Seal. Um, I think we're in their what late twenties. Um, uh, but they were both students at Merritt College, one of the community colleges in Oakland, and that's where they met. They met in these like radical discussion groups that um, a lot of black students were having on campus at the time. Um, and so these these young African American men get together and they say, you know, like we're going to push back against the police. And so the spectacle of them, you know, marching on the Capitol, uh, displaying guns, um, that visual. Uh, it has to be understood as sort of like a symbol of what they were doing every day on the ground in Oakland, which was arming themselves and driving around and patrolling the police, you know, policing the police, patrolling the police. Um, and so they pushed back really hard against the Oakland Police Department. And this probably was a bit of a surprise to OPD, but the department quickly formed um, what it called the Panther Squad which was a dedicated unit of police officers who um, their entire job was to track the, the doings of the Black Panther Party. Um, the Oakland Police Department and the Alameda County District Attorney's Office, they were already pretty wired into the uh, national sort of intel apparatus of you know, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice. And they were already feeding information to these federal agencies and other police agencies about the Black Panther Party, and they were noticing that you know the 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 Panthers were creating organizations in different cities um, to push back against uh, police brutality. So this happens, you know, in in the mid '60s um, through the early 1970s. Is this uh, very uh, pronounced period of resistance? Something really that Oakland and probably most cities in the United States just hadn't really seen. It was sort of the um, the brilliant invention of black radicals was to really identify policing in particular as one of the main problems that they had to overcome if they were to address the, the, the broader inequities, uh, you know, in the economy, in housing discrimination and racism and poverty. It's also one of the points where they're actually able throughout uh, their organizing efforts beyond o just Oakland nationally, they're able to get a lot of uh, cross-racial solidarity from Latinos, from the young white students in the new left who had experienced tremendous police brutality during the anti-Vietnam uh, War demonstrations. Um, it really served as kind of a, as, as a circuit, you know, they, they connected the circuit in ways that radical movements previously Maybe in the 1930s, you had a little bit of success with American, um, the American Communist Party to a certain degree, but this was a little bit newer. It was separate from the older um, kind of the old left so, or organizing. The new left really was a tremendous moment for, um, you know, for racial solidarity. And a lot of it centered around opposition to this suppressive atmosphere, this suppressive law enforcement um, apparatus, which it's worth remembering a lot of the um, a lot of the participants in the new left either had been on the sharp end of it, um, of racialized, you know, racialized policing of the cops enforcing these ghettos that had been created by, you know, the powers that be in the northern and western cities um, after the Second World War. Or they're, if you're looking at the new left folks, their parents were on the receiving end of the McCarthy era, which was right beforehand, where you had a tremendous amount of surveillance of um not just suspected communists, but also folks who, like Paul Robeson, who engaged in cross-racial organizing. So it was a, it can't be understated how important that moment was. And also like Oakland was a massive, massive center for the new left. And it's interesting how that, that uh, solidarity work kind of highlights that it wasn't just racialized policing it 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 was a kind of socio-political policing and, and it so distorted the view of of what was a crime problem and who were the criminal organizations and there's a a, a story you tell about a anti-war protest that tries to come into oakland and and the oakland police actually uh deputized is probably too strong a word but but certainly unleash the uh, Hell's Angels. 
which mm -hmm. of course is a very dangerous criminal organization, but they had some ability to interact in, in Oakland without police interference. Yeah, the anti-war demonstrations, you know, of course, um, grew partly out of the student radical movement at UC Berkeley, which was growing out of, again, the civil rights movement. Because if you, you know, if you trace back these different movements, right, the free speech movement at Berkeley, it was partly a movement to have free speech to talk about the civil rights movement that was going on in the South, to be able to table about it on Sproul, Sproul Plaza at UC Berkeley. And so when the administration cracks down on that, right, at least the free speech movement and then the student radical movement starts growing more and more. And then the anti-war movement joins forces and sort of becomes part of an, an outgrowth of the student uh, radical movement. And that joins forces, you know, with the Panthers and other radical movements uh, in the Bay Area. And so these these this movement of movements that's trying to like take on the the Vietnam War at the time, they're organizing these large marches to the Army Induction Center in Oakland with this very large facility down on I think it was on San Pablo Avenue right downtown, where you know hundreds of men a day are being um, inducted in the military and then shipped off to you know a training camp probably in Southern California or somewhere else to get their you know however many weeks training it was and then shipped off to Vietnam where they're you know, likely going to be injured and traumatized um, uh, during the war. And so these these marches are heading toward the induction center. And the Oakland Police Department, once again, as you said, it's this socio-political policing, right? Like um, the purpose isn't really to avert crime and, and, and violence. The purpose is to shut down a movement that's trying to inter interfere with the federal government's ability to, re to, to recruit and train soldiers, uh, to draft and recruit um, and train soldiers for the war. Um, so the police department, you know, sets up these skirmish lines. And yeah, like the, the Hells Angels at the time are this um, kind of conservative right wing organization, people today think of, oh, you know, motorcycle gangs, these are rebels, they have problems with authority. Well, you know, that's not really the case with the uh, with the Hells Angels, it's a bit more complicated. And the Hells Angels were very patriotic, pro United States, pro war. And they didn't like um, the student radicals at Berkeley, the anti-war movement. And so the Oakland police kind of looked the other way and allowed the Hells Angels on at least one occasion to come in and violently assault some of the people who were taking part in the march. But the police didn't just need to allow, you know, these auxiliaries, like similar to the, you know, American Legion or others who they had used in the past to beat up left-wing radicals. The police themselves um, on multiple occasions, but there was one very intense protest in particular where the Oakland Police Department and the California Highway Patrol, um, they just brutally beat protesters, dragged them out of the street, tear gassed them. Um, one, of the, one of the most interesting documents that remains from, uh, from that particular protest in the late 60s um, are the, is, a, is a series of recollections by uh, members of the news media who were there to just cover it that day. And these like, you know, these TV news people and like with their microphones and their cameras, um, they're just brutally beaten also in the street told without discrimination. You know, the police don't care who it is. They're just beating everyone up. And so they have this, they, you know, they, they wrote down their, you know, um, experiences from the day of just being like kicked and beaten and thrown into the gutter. Um, it was definitely the case that the Oakland Police Department um, viewed its mission as, you know, preventing the anti-war movement from uh, interfering in any material way with the war effort. We've also got really interesting evidence from that period of not just, so the, I'll first talk about the Hells Angels and then about OPD's own internal mentality and culture. So the Hells Angels, their leader at the time was Sonny Barger, who was a white working class man from East, the East Oakland Flats. It's worthwhile noting, so now to these days, most of East Oakland, um, west of Freeway 580 is predominantly Latino and Black and Asian. But during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, up until the basically the late 60s, early 70s, this was a white working class area of the city. 
and remained as such. African Americans were in West Oakland and North Oakland. There were some Chinese and Asians in the area around Lake Merritt, but the area where Sonny Barger lived and where the Hells Angels clubhouse still is to this day on high on Foothill around like 40th Ave, 40th Avenue or something like that. Um, that was that was very much a white working class area. And it's where the Hells Angels drew their core from. And OPD relied in a way, you know, the anecdotal accounts that we got both from news and from folks who lived in that area. OPD relied on the Hells Angels in a way to kind of enforce the racial red lines of Oakland at that point in time. And they also used the, the angels as not just an auxiliary force for cracking heads with the new left. They also used them to gather intelligence. Um, during Sonny Barger's homicide trial in the late 1970s, it emerged that OPD had handlers who would speak with the angels and kind of, you know, trade, trade bits of in, trade horses with them. Um, the angels would tip off the police department about where the new left, the Black Panthers, the Symbionese Liberation Army, Brown Berets, what have you, where their safe houses were, their explosives, their firearms, their document mills, where those were based. And in turn, the police department would turn a blind eye to the Hells Angels, you know, criminal activities, which by the late 70s, early 80s, included international methamphetamine smuggling rings back at, down to Australia and even attempts by Oakland angels to murder Australian federal police who interfered with their business. So they really worked kind of the relationship between the police department and this white, you know, hyper-conservative auxiliary was really made possible, not just by the racial politics and kind of strange bedfellows at the time, but it was also made possible by OPD's own internal culture, which had kind of hardened by the mid 1960s into essentially, you know, John Birch Society with badges. We had a document, a really fascinating PhD dissertation written by one of Oakland's first black cops, Gwen Pearson, who was a Tuskegee Airman before he was um, in World War II, before he joined first the fire department and then the police department. He lateraled into the police department because OPD wouldn't hire blacks straight up um, in the late 1940s. And as part of his dissertation, he laid out the attitudes the racial attitudes within the department and how rock ribbed it was. Um, the motor unit, for instance, the motorcycle unit would not have African-American officers. They did not trust them with pulling over black uh, motorists. They were incredibly harsh towards um, towards African-American drivers, um, lenient with white drivers. And when it came to um, training, there were there was a lieutenant in the Oakland Police Department who gave lectures to John Birch Society chapters as an OPD lieutenant in uniform, claiming that the 1965 Watts uprising was a, quote, communist plot. So this is the attitude that really kind of had hardened and had shaped the, the culture of the police department in Oakland. And it wasn't unique. But when you consider the, you know, fervor and the intensity of the new left opposition of the you know, the shooting wars that the Black Panthers had with the Oakland Police Department, it makes sense that there's on the opposite side, kind of this countervailing culture. And can you talk a little bit about how how different West Coast policing was from other policing efforts in the South and, and in the East Coast, uh, and particularly around this issue, uh, where other West Coast police departments like LAPD became highly mil militarized in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Yeah, the you know again, this goes all the way back to the origins of different police departments um, on the East Coast and in the South, in the Southeast in particular. You can literally trace, and, and scholars have done this, right? You can trace some of the police departments, their origins back to these organizations that were, you know, more or less known as slave patrols, right? These are um, posses of like white men who would get together and track down and, uh, and arrest and put into servitude slaves who were, you know, either trying to escape enslavement and get to another state or simply out after hours without a pass or something like that. These are these are the sort of terrorist organizations that are enforcing slavery firsthand. And so people, you know, scholars have shown how those ended up developing and influencing police departments that emerge in places like South Carolina and Florida and other areas um, 
in the Northeast, there's some of that, but the origins of the police departments there are a bit, a bit more urban. Um, and so the, the project of policing, um, you know, early on is, is uh, maybe a bit more influenced by the police uh, departments that are emerging in places like London, um, you know, a bit more of this like metropolitan um, sort of class-based policing and policing ar around uh, lines of um, ethnicity amongst different immigrants. Um, you go to the West Coast, uh, you know, as we stated at the outset here, policing very much had to do um, early on with patrolling the lines of difference between the Chinese population and the white population, or what was, the, you know, the the groups of European immigrants who were becoming white in America by making others of the Chinese and um, Native Americans and other groups, right? And so the police were kind of patrolling that line. Now, if you zoom, if you zoom forward, um, fast forward through the development of police departments on the West Coast, again, you see how they, over time, they take on these different missions as society is transforming. And so, yeah, as the, as the, you know, labor movement rises, um, or, you know, around World War One, and then again, in the Great Depression, you see a lot of policing that's focused on, you know, strike breaking or things like that. Um, World War II definitely brings about, uh, and, and the Great Mi Migration brings about that intense shift in focus, especially for West Coast police departments, onto African Americans. Because again, most West Coast cities didn't have a large African American population until the 1940s and after. And so the police departments there, it's like a light goes on in their head and they think, oh, our primary purpose now is to enforce the color line between white and black. Um, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s also, um, West Coast police departments start taking a bit of a different trajectory from a lot of other police departments in the country in the sense that West Coast police departments start to be professionalized a little bit more. And I don't, you know, we don't mean professionalized as a good or a bad thing. This is not a normative word. It just is what it is. It's the, the people within the um the work of policing they start to view themselves in a particular way they start to um elaborate uh an increasingly um complicated set of like policies and ethics and rules that they follow um police departments also start getting a lot more resources and because of the way that west coast cities developed they're less dense um, they require cars to get around so West Coast police departments early on adopt radios, squad cars, and some other technologies that you don't see in East Coast departments that are like still doing a lot of like foot patrols and stuff like that. Um, so you end up by the 1960s, 1970s, West Coast police departments are, um, the officers are paid a little bit better. And, and increasingly, you know, you, you come to the present West Coast cops are paid significantly more than East Coast cops. Uh, West Coast cops tend to ride around in squad cars. They tend to be, there tends to be an ethic that is more militaristic. Um, the departments uh, themselves, they view themselves more as like a paramilitary type organization. Um, and those sort of, that, that kind of like disciplinary sense is more ingrained in the police cultures on the West Coast. The LAPD is really the epitome of this, right? The LAPD, the um, the stereotypical LAPD officer of like the 1970s, 80s, or 90s is this like thin, physically fit, muscular guy who rides around alone in a patrol car and is capable of doing all things. And um, Oakland sort of, o Oakland is is very much a mirror image of LA. East Coast departments, very different. I'm sure Ali has a bit to say about East Coast departments and sort of how they're different. Yeah, they're more civil service jobs. Um, the pay is lower. The training standards are not as high. Um, I mean, today, like the just sheer level to which some of the physical and training standards have dropped in the academy level and then recertification levels. Um, it's kind of night and day, um, but you did, you know, this does also have a fact, it has to do with manpower, right? Um, East Coast cities, again, they're denser. Um, they tend to employ more officers per, 
you know, per population per um, hundred thousand than West Coast officers. Backup comes faster. West Coast officers tended to be um, you had to have more proficiency with firearms, with you know, use of force techniques, restraints, that sort of thing. So the department's really hired for that and kept a certain standard. Oakland certainly being one of the most active departments in the state, um, calls for service, uh, for, for calls of service, and also for the city's actual crime rate, which did increase exponentially between 1960 and 1980, um, as white flight, deindustrialization, Prop 13, um, all kicked in. And, you know, the rise in street-based narcotics market, the gray economy, that sort of thing. It really did change the way that the cops are trained and how they're recruited. Um, you know, the, and also there are all these still to this day, massive military installations up and down the West Coast. And there are a lot of people who demobilize through those institutions. So it's not just California. Similar thing is reflected in departments up in Portland, um, Seattle, where, you know, you have large military bases just south of there in the Seattle Tacoma area. So it, it, there's there's a big ethos difference and also an operational difference. But the way that manifests is that you see less, um, I'm not saying you don't see any, but you see less graft based corruption on the West Coast where and the incidences of excessive force civil rights violations tend to be uh, just that. They tend to be incidents where the cops brutalize people where they arrest people um, and frame them up for evidence, where it's kind of noble cause corruption, you know, the ends justify the means. Um, and that's the sort of story that happened with the rioters, that happened with Rampart um, to an extent that happens, for instance, with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's, County Sheriff's um, gangs, um, Santa Ana Police Department, they have their own little um, metropolitan, you know, their enforcement team, which behaves like a gang on duty. That's something that you'll see marked out throughout West Coast police departments. Um, and it is notably different than what happens back East. And, and I wanted to go through this history um, because uh, it, it's easy to look at the writers and the scope of the abuses that they were involved in, in, in not only the brutality they inflicted on the community, but planting drugs and engaging in other kinds of misconduct uh, at a period where, where the Oakland police had diversified. These, these aren't Klan members anymore. They're not even all white, uh, you, you know, but they, are, they also aren't outliers, right? They're a product of the time. And even under a, a, what people would consider a liberal administration in Oakland at that point, they were given the green light. It wasn't like they were operating in secret doing those things. That was what was ex accepted from the police department. And, and in fact, part of the crime suppression efforts that, that were going on at the time that were bipartisan in, 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 in driving them. Yeah, it's really complicated. Um... The writers were the, the four writers officers who ended up getting fired from the police department and put on trial twice for a rap of criminal. Trial. What's that? Three of them were on trial. Yeah, sorry. Three of them actually. Well, yeah. four of them were charged. Three of them showed up for the trial. Um, one of them decided not to show up and he's a fugitive to this day. That's a that's another story. But so two, two of the writers who were indicted were Filipino Americans. Uh, one of them was white. And then one of them was a Mexican American man, uh, Frank Vasquez. He's the one who actually fled before the trial got underway. Um, he didn't show up to arraignment. Uh, and he's a fugitive to this day. Um, and by the year 2000, OPD had diversified a little bit. Um, still the overwhelming majority of its officers about 70 percent were white and th that's about the same percentage today i believe it's about 60 percent white today the largest demographic groups in the oakland police department are white men and uh hispanic or latino men today as the department class the, the department has its own racial classifications and it uses hispanic and white uh, and those are the two largest demographics today only about 10 percent, i think of the department currently sworn officers are African-American. Um, and it's been hard for them to, they, the, the department has never been able to match its demographics to the demographics of the city, but 
it has gotten to a point where in the early 2000s, you know, for example, around the time of the writers, the, the police chief is black and there are African-Americans in leadership posts in the police department. Um, just recently until the poli- the current police chief was dismissed in a you know corruption scandal that unfolded over the last few months, um, he also was African-American and a majority of his leadership team as deputy chiefs um, were people of color and women. So the department has become a little bit more diverse, but structurally what's going on is that even as police departments like Oakland diversify, the department itself and the policing that it's doing in the community, it's still focused on street level crimes that they end up uh, uh, enforcing against and arresting majority people of color. And in Oakland, it's overwhelming. The the people who are impacted by the criminal justice system are overwhelmingly black. And so it's so we sort of shifted away from this previous era, you know, the 1960s when most cops were white men and they were attacking an African, mostly African-American community. to today, the department is a little bit more diverse, but still the people on the receiving end of the criminal justice system and the, you know, like the Oakland police, I think their budget is about $300 million a year. It's a huge, it's a huge budget for a city um, of its size. And that, that apparatus is still primarily aimed at um, an African-American uh, population in East and West Oakland. Um, and to, to some extent, also the Latino population in the city. And the heroes uh, of your book uh, are, are two civil rights attorneys, John Burris and Jim Channon, uh, who who used uh, litigation as a way to try to hold Oakland accountable. Why don't, why don't you talk about the efforts that they made and what provided them the opportunity to actually get a settlement agreement? Sure. So John and Jim are two, they come from very different places. Um, and they're a bit of a, they're an odd team, but they're, Jim is uh, Jim's a, from a family, a Jewish family right outside of New York uh, City um, in the suburbs to the north. And he grew up relatively conservative, um, you know, was into ROTC and really, you know, kind of an all-American kid. But then when he went to um, he went to school, he went to university at UC Berkeley, that really, you know, his experiences with the way that um policing was handled around the anti-war demonstrations and the cities out there really changed his view, views on things. And after, I believe he was a PhD student at some point in South Asian studies, but then he, you know, his was working on the initial Berkeley police review commission and his life was, sorry, if I interrupt, Jim was actually at the people's park protest and he was shot in the back by an Alameda County Sheriff's deputy using a shotgun and Jim doesn't know he thinks it was salt in the in the shotgun propellant he thinks he was shot in the back with salt and he was also at the anti-war protest at the army induction center in the late 60s when OPD beat everybody up so he had these like early experiences of like police brutality alongside protesters he was radicalized um the induction day protest in the downtown Oakland center. He also describes like Joan Baez coming and doing, you know, singing in front of the crowd and have, you know, getting taken away very genteelly in cuffs in front of the cameras. And then that's when the baton started flying once she was out of the way. Um, But, you know, Jim decides to become a lawyer and hold police accountable after he works on this early civilian oversight committee, the Berkeley police uh, review commission. And um, John comes, John is African-American, grew up in Oakland, went to, I believe after law school, he leaves to become a prosecutor in Chicago, in Cook County. He was first a prosecutor in Alameda, then goes to Cook County, and then is brought back to Alameda County to investigate the police killing of a young man named Melvin Black, who was shot by Oakland uh, police officers in North Oakland after for su- suspectedly, you know, shooting at cars with a BB pistol with a BB gun. Um, and he was shot while fleeing um, those officers. Uh, it was a I believe the case happened in 1980 and engendered a tremendous outroar um, from the 
you know, the remnants of the Black Panther Party at that point in time, they were kind of falling apart in Oakland for a number of different reasons, but also the new left. And that later led to the creation of an Oakland civilian um, oversight um, body for police. But John was brought in to kind of do the official postmortem and the review of the incident, the independent review. And the thinking was, oh, well, the in-house thinking was this guy will kind of tow the company line and do what he's told. But his report actually excoriated the police department and said, essentially, this is an unlawful killing. This is an unjust killing. It wasn't acted on, but it kind of set out his, it was his break from law enforcement and from, you know, the world of prosecutors. And from that moment on, throughout the 1980s, Burris and Shannon on their own file, um, they attempt to correct the behavior of um, and rectify the behavior of rogue police departments and abusive police departments by systematically suing them for in-custody deaths, officer-involved shootings, excessive force, um, patterns of ra- of uh, false arrest or racial profiling, and they secure big payouts for their their um, their clients, for the victims, um, time and time and time again in Oakland, in Richmond, in Berkeley, sometimes a little bit further afield, but nothing changes. You know, there's no systemic change. The idea that you can make a city adjust its um, behavior, a police department adjusts its behavior by hitting their pocketbook. Well, if they're not shouldering the bill themselves, it's the taxpayers who pay out. You know, guess what? They're going to keep hitting up that piggy bank for more cash when the, ta- you know, when the, when the bill comes due. So they had both independently tried to Fail to lock in to figure out a way to deal with systemic abuses within Oakland police, which always centered around issues of race, racial profiling, um, disproportionate stops and arrests of African American men for petty offenses, drug offenses, nonviolent offenses. Um, and during the late 1990s, they each separately had their own encounters with people who would walk in and say, I got framed up in this by this officer on. 10th and Peralta. I got framed up by this officer on 12th and Wood. Um, This guy stopped me on San Pablo and Adeline and planted a bag of crack on my, uh, you know, in my shoes. And they just couldn't tie things together. But I believe um, one day, Jim Channon in the, I think it was 2000 or late nine, it was 2000, um, had a case involving one of the riders, one of the riders officers. And um, the DA's office came to him and said, hey, listen, we want to settle. What will it take? That never happened for the sort of crime that they were looking at, for the sort of drug crime that they were looking at. So he said, okay, something's wrong here. They're scared about this. They want to pay out. They're coming to me early. What's going on? And then when the news of this young officer, Keith Batt, hit the papers about him blowing the whistle on the squad of officers that he'd been riding around with during his two weeks on the job, who would frame people up, beat them, um, plant evidence on them, um, torture them. Let's not mince words. Um, I don't know how else you describe emptying a can of pepper spray into somebody's mouth or beating them on the soles of their feet till they can't walk, which is all behavior that the riders uh, committed in front of Keith. Um, Something clicked. And as the Alameda County DA mounted their own investigation of the riders, and their investigation was strictly focused on those four officers and what Keith Batt observed during his two weeks. It was a circumscribed investigation from the beginning and that limited the scope. They didn't limit their scope. And they kind of went back and worked and established their own witnesses, went back to the clients who came in beforehand, uh, went out and found people who had been subjected, who'd been arrested by the riders, charged, convicted, jailed, uh, imprisoned, and put together a list of, I believe, 119 plaintiffs who had been arrested during this period of time. Uh, some of the incidents went as far back to ni- as 1995, um, in different areas of the city, not just West Oakland, but parts of East Oakland, where officers like Frank Vasquez had patrolled. The list of officers named in the civil suit was far was far larger. And they filed their um, their class action in Northern California, uh, in the District of Northern California, in federal court. And the bill that the city of Oakland was looking at at the time was massive. There was a contemporaneous scandal in Los Angeles, the Rampart scandal, which um, led to tens of millions of dollars of payouts from the city of Los Angeles. Oakland's bill was comparable at that point. So the city was scrambling to find a way out. And they said, okay, what do we do? Uh, We'll sign a consent decree. You know, this is a pattern practice suit. We'll sign a consent decree. We want to establish a reform program. We want to set this out. We would like to have a better police department. We want to move forward. And um, 
you know, this is Mayor Jerry Brown, who's a left wing, ostensibly was a left wing mayor when he was campaigning in the late 1990s. By the time he actually gets into office, he sets forth a redevelopment and gentrification plan that one of his own um, staffers called, told us was, um, you know, he termed it as Rudy Giuliani West. Um, it was that sort of zero tolerance, clean up the streets, disnify the city approach. And Brown um, never took accountability for this. And frankly, the DA's office and the attorney general at the time in California and the U.S. attorney all passed on their responsibility to come in and hold the police department accountable. It was kind of just left out there floating as a bag, um, this you know, open item. And uh, the consent decree that the city ended up signing with these two private plaintiffs um, established an oversight structure that you do see with formal pattern and practice investigations that are brought either by the Federal Department of Justice or the state's attorneys general to create a reform program that's overseen by a court and that is binding. You can't get out of it. You can't sign off on it unless the judge overseeing it says you've accomplished what you need to accomplish. And in Oakland, that was signed in 2003 within weeks of maybe not even within weeks, maybe the same week that it was signed, um, the police department brutalized a anti-war protest at the port of Oakland, um, fired rubber dowels at them, beanbags, tear gas, drove over protesters with Harley Davidson motorcycles with something they called a bump tactic, B-U-M-P. Um, and uh, that demonstrated very quickly that the department had not uh, absorbed the reality that they were under a different level of oversight. And that oversight continues to this day, uh, 20 years later. It is the longest running oversight case for any police department, sheriff's agency in the United States. It is an edge, it's an edge case and it's not going away anytime soon, sadly. And, and it's fascinating to me that, that, you know, the kind of police misconduct that you document in the book, both before the writers, during the reign of the writers and, and lasting right up to the present day is usually the type of activity that, that, that draws FBI attention, that draws the US attorney's office. But they seem to have have abandoned uh, Oakland, and it's really uh, left it to the community and people in the community to to try to work to to bring their uh, police department under civilian control. And, and uh, you have one one piece of writing that that I just thought really explained it very well, uh, where where you write that. Uh, Where is it? Yes. O Oaklanders had called for more police and better public safety in response to violence that had claimed thousands of lives over the previous 30 years. But the city's Black community wanted constitutional policing. They cried out for it since the late 1940s, carried guns to police the police in the 1960s, and demanded civilian oversight in the late 1970s. But the concept really nev had never really come to fruition in Oakland. And this is why in the early and mid 2000s, as the Oakland Police Department ignored the reform mandate it had been ordered to achieve, that the city would experience the deadly consequences of an incorrigible police culture. And what I think you do so well is show that this not this this zero tolerance policing that the the police department culture doesn't want to let go of in spite of uh, uh all these efforts to to reform it uh also put police in harm's way and you you have and as a former undercover agent at the fbi you know the story of the black undercover agent who was shot and killed in friendly fire incident uh but also just the 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 uh the lack of proper accountability within the supervisory ranks of the Oakland Police Department led to a horrific uh, quadruple homicide of police officers. And, and, you know, we always equate this idea that public safety requires more aggressive policing when time and time again, that's proven not to be true in Oakland. You know, how do you think we can get to the place where, where we overcome the police resistance to reform? Yeah, that's a that's a difficult question to answer. Um, 
I guess to start off, I mean, what what you're alluding to in the um, in the the run up to that question is um, the passage you read uh, from the book um, is is setting up the mid two thousands in which Ali and I describe a series of controversial, highly controversial police shootings um, where Oakland police officers are stopping and confronting usually young black men and killing them. And it, and it comes to be known that these young men were unarmed um, and that they were in various ways, not threatening the police officers who killed them. Um, in the mid two thousands, it was common for OPD to kill, you know, eight, 10, 15 people in a year and two or three or four of them would be more or less unarmed. And it would come out afterward that they had had, you know, like a scale or a cell phone or something on them. And the police would claim, oh, well, they, you know, I thought that was a gun. And I, you know, thought that my life was being threatened. And there was, there was virtually no accountability. Um, The city uh, and state law in California had created a situation in which it was nearly impossible to fire police officers for these types of incidents. The officers were highly protected. And even when the internal affairs unit of the Oakland Police Department would do a proper investigation, which they rarely did, even when they would, and when they would find that the officers needlessly killed someone, and when they would recommend that that person be fired, the city was unable to uphold to uphold these decisions to fire police officers because the city had underinvested resources in the attorneys and administrators necessary to make those discipline decisions stick so the police officers union frequently could convince an arbitrator who the city had agreed through the police union's contract to allow the police to contest any discipline decisions through binding arbitration So these arbitrators would frequently find in favor of the cops, rehire them. And a lot of the a lot of state laws protecting officers and their rights would play into this. And so there was this lack of accountability for these very brutal, very violent incidents. And this came back to haunt the police department in a major way, because in encouraging this unaccountable culture of violence within the police department, um, that led to what what you alluded to, which was the the killing of an undercover officer uh, by two rookie cops. Um, but then later um, in two thousand nine, in March two thousand nine, the slaying of four police officers in a completely botched um, uh, situation. Two two motorcycle officers who were shot and killed by a man named Lavelle Mixon, who fled, hid in an apartment building, and then this disastrous decision by these. Um, commanders to put together an ad hoc SWAT team to raid the building um, led to the the murder of two other officers, a just completely disastrous situation. And so these were the deadly consequences of a department that was unwilling to change. It was it was killing people in the community and it was killing its own officers at the same time. This was this was sort of the worst situation uh, possible for policing. Um, so your question is kind of geared toward, you know, like, how do you change, how, how does that change? Um, you know, the, the positive story here is that that has changed a little bit for OPD. Mm -hmm. Um, OPD is still a deeply problematic department. I mean, it's, it's undergoing a scandal right now in which its police chief was just fired for basically looking the other way and allowing the head of internal affairs to, let a, a, a sergeant off with very lax discipline for some very egregious violations. Um, this is a d- deeply corrupt thing. But one thing the department does a lot less now is it it kills far fewer people. And I know that's a weird thing to say, right? It's, it's still killing people, but officer-involved shootings, as they call them, have plummeted in Oakland. Um, I think there was one last year like one officer, there was one police shooting in Oakland, one or two police shootings in Oakland last year. There used to be 15 in a year. Like normally the average would be 12 or 15. Um, 
And so why, why did that change come about? Well, our, the, what, what we observed in looking at the, the historical record and looking at the internal affairs documents of the department and speaking with officers um, who had been there for many decades is that it wasn't the police department leadership and it wasn't the city of Oakland leadership who thought we've got to change this and, you know, and, and brought about policies and rules and regulations and made sure that discipline actually like stuck. That wasn't it. What actually changed this was, again, it was the external pressures on the department by the community to demand it to change. So it's sort of um, the Oscar Grant movement, uh, which kicked off in 2009, uh, right around the same time that the Lavelle Mixon, actually a few months before the Lavelle Mixon shooting in March, right? Um, Oscar Grant is murdered by a barrier transit police officer in uh, January. And the movement that rises from that sort of um, that's sort of a precursor of the Black Lives Matter movement in a lot of ways. And that movement is extremely strong in Oakland. And it really reinvigorated the the stalled efforts to um, force the police department to change. So a lot of that activism then feeds into and supports efforts to transform policing in Oakland. So the department is a little bit less violent today, and it and the some of the more egregious things that it that it used to do, it does less of. And all that said, you know, it, does that make them a great department? Does that does that mean you know game over? Let, we can all go home. Of course not. I mean, if you ask, you know, and and my day job is talking to people in Oakland, editing the news website I do. The, the the common opinion in Oakland is there's still a long way to go before policing gets to that better place, if that's even possible. Yeah, and, and I could talk to you guys all day, but if there are other questions uh, panelists have, yes, please, Mary. Thank you all for that, uh, that invigorating, angering, summation of your of your book and thank you Michael for for your lead for taking the lead in this uh, we have in our audience majority students most of whom are juniors and seniors and I think they're probably trying to figure out how you guys got to where you are so this is a little bit personal don't you know feel free to to say as little or much as you want about your lives but you know you all are are you know older than our students but they're still trying to figure out what they want to do so could you tell us a little bit of how you got from there to here sure i mean i um i'm from back east um i grew up in new york city during uh the giuliani era of uh, zero tolerance policing and um you know i'm white but um still saw a lot. Um, my friends I, who I grew up with and played baseball with, played soccer with, hung out with, um, a lot of them were white. You got to see a ways in which that sort of, that style of policing really shaped people's lives early on. Um, when I came back to the city from, um, from college, I wanted to be a reporter as opposed, I was a history student and I got tired of reading primary sources and I wanted to serve, I wanted to write them. So, um, I got, a job at a newspaper across the river in Jersey City, which is a pretty rough and tumble place. If any of you have seen the film Clockers, that's based on a novel set in Jersey City. It's not about New York. Um, and it's a good film. So I learned, I started doing day-to-day -day coverage. I gravitated towards criminal justice reporting because you can explain so much about American society and look at so many different aspects of it through the lens of policing, the courts, jails, prisons, what have you. Um, I worked for another paper, 2008. Um, I wanted to go to graduate school and study um, and learn how to be a better investigative reporter, study with Lowell Bergman at UC Berkeley. Um, so I moved across the country to, to, um, to the East Bay and began focusing almost immediately on um, the issue of officer-involved shootings in Oakland in 2008, um, going through 2009 and 10. Um, and after that, uh, I started to cover the ins and outs of local police departments around the Bay Area, 
and California for um, for some local websites. And over time, I just kind of branched out into different fields and um, and areas of reporting on surveillance, criminal justice, extremism. Darwin and I met um, in 2012. Um, at some that point, I'd been I was pretty deeply immersed in reporting on policing for our local um, all weekly there, the East Bay Express. And Darwin was also working for them as a freelancer. Um, and we met over a photograph of mine that he'd used on his website. Um, we decided at some point, hey, look, let's, let's sit down and talk. We have uh, interests in common. We write about similar things. We write about power. We write about money. Let's look at let's look at policing. Let's look at how the system works here in Oakland. So we started writing together then, um, and we kind of developed a, a working partnership um, and used our various strengths um, over time to kind of just turn the department inside out and really pick over every little thing that had happened and try and get to the bottom of the story that we tell it, we tell through writers, which is, um, why this police department, why reform is so hard, why there are so many intractable problems there, and what that says on a broader scale about American law enforcement. So we think it has lessons to offer for, for everyone else, but that's the capsule of my life. Yeah, I was um, I was on an academic track. I was uh, uh, in a graduate sociology graduate program at UC Santa Barbara in the early 2000s. Um, and, uh, you know, up to that point, um, I, I sort of thought, you know, career wise and, you know, the work I wanted to do, I, I wanted to be a sociologist. I wanted to be an academic. I wanted to study inequality and I wanted to um, publish there and teach. And I thought that's how I could, like, make a meaningful difference to the world. And um, I was fortunate enough to have some really great professors and I was able to um, uh be a teaching assistant and later run some courses in the sociology department and the black studies department, um, where a lot of the professors really just kind of like opened my eyes to, um, you know, race and inequality in America and the need to really deeply study that stuff. Um, but I, uh, got my degree, uh, in the depths of the, um, great depression or great recession, sorry, the, um, 2009, 2010, you know, housing bubble had burst and, um, uh, and so there were no academic jobs. And so um, I started looking around and working as a, um, a freelance journalist a little bit and just publishing stuff. Um, and yeah, that's how I met Ali working in Oakland. I was writing a lot about like housing and banking and finance and um, wow. yeah, stuff like that. And um, uh, got to say, I, you know, didn't really see myself as want wanting to work on policing. I just wasn't super interested in it. Um, but uh, yeah, I then ended up spending, you know, the subsequent 10 years um, uh, largely working with Ali to like report on policing, policing in Oakland. And, um, you know, we've done some reporting in other cities around um, law enforcement uh, related topics like police foundations and um, police leadership and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, now I'm just, a, you know, uh, an editor of a local news website. Um, it's sort of the, the next thing in media, a lot of, a lot of the big regional papers that used to be the place where, you know, um, power would be held accountable, um, are shrinking and disappearing. You know, people have seen like the destruction of the Gannett newspapers and the newspapers owned by like, you know, hedge funds and stuff that are closing them down. Um, there's a lot of new, um, smaller media organizations that are sprouting up in different cities across the country. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to work for one of them um, as my day job, uh, my day job. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, your candor and uh, letting us into your lives a little bit. Um, and congratulations on your book. Uh, I think it's, it's, um, I can hardly wait to read it. I have not read it yet. Uh, I have read about it, but uh, congratulations. I think you all have done a spectacular job. Uh, I, I'm just, I wish we had time because I think this, this question of diver diversifying police departments is something that we sort of take for granted. And the, the incident with the five police officers who killed the, the black man, the five black police officers, I mean, we have to rethink that entire paradigm, don't we? 
because you know we see black police chiefs, we see black captains, lieutenants, uh, who are basically doing the same thing as the white guys are doing. So, uh, and we see more women going into law enforcement, and we don't see, you know, we expected from the 1970s, we expected a huge change in the way police departments reacted, responded to the community. And that just has not happened, even though there's more diversity. I think LA Sheriff's Department, I, I want to say there's more than 50% Latinos on, yeah. on LA Sheriff's Department. And mm -hmm. uh, we don't see, I mean, these guys are leading the gang in in the, uh, so, you know, just just my, my two cents about uh, diversifying police departments. If you yeah, guys I think, just want to have a closing statement, maybe. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think that, um, uh, you know, the the former sociologist in me um, wants to say that our, our profession, our colleagues, like, figured this out decades ago. Yeah. Um, it's not necessary, like, to have racist and racially unequal outcomes, it's not necessary for there to be people operating with bias right? That's what systemic or structural racism is now. And, and so law enforcement and criminal justice in America is deeply systemically racist. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't help that there are actually still a lot of people working in law enforcement who also are racist or have bias. Um, although it's, a, although it's more hidden now, they have to hide it more than they did in the past. Although if people want to just quickly look up, you know, a, another scandal that's going on here in the San Francisco Bay Area right now, just look up what's going on with the Antioch Police Department and the release of these massive trove of racist text messages that's just now coming out. Um, this is just the most recent example of how within the profession of policing, there are people at very high levels leading the police unions and the departments um, who openly talk amongst themselves in racist terms and are, are motivated by bias. Yeah, you see the same. There's a, something very similar in the Torrance Police Department as well um, in the South Bay, um, whereby you have a group of several, I think it's at least a dozen officers involved in um, who are caught um, exchanging racist messages, actually making, um, you know, congratulating when they arrested one of the members as luck would have it, of the same white power gang that Darwin and I were reporting on when we first met Mike in 2007, the Rise Above movement, they congratulate him. They say, oh, thank you, you know, for doing what you're doing for our race. And, you know, you're really fighting the good fight. They're saying this to a criminal, somebody who served time in CDCR, who's, who's up right now on a federal indictment, on a conspiracy to riot indictment. Um, there really is, at the core of it, you know, law enforcement deep down has a reactionary core in America. It's very, very deep in there. It's kind of like the base essence of the institution. And over time, you'll see this kind of pendulum swings when there's more of a momentum towards reform and change and you know, stamping that out and trying to move the institution towards a public service model. And then over time, and then at other instances, okay. you'll see a reactionary moment where you know, we need to take back the streets or we need to give the silent majority their voice. You know, you see this in the late 1970s, early 1980s, you see it in the 1990s. You're seeing it now with the basic, you know, you have folks like your sheriff in Riverside County, Chad Bianco was a, was a dues paying member of the Oath Keepers. He makes common cause with far right wing activists, with militia churches, three percenters, one of whom there's a photograph of him char with a guy who's up on federal charges for storming the Capitol on January 6th. You know, these people, they make company has no problem, no compunction with this sort of thing. And that's because there's a moment now where law where that reactionary foreign law enforcement has been able to expand its influence. It was certainly aided and abetted by the occupant of the White House uh, from 2017 through early 2021, um, you know, by the way that he basically courted them. Um, the way, you know, there was at one point that he held a rally on Long Island in New York City and New York State. Um, Long Island is where tons of NYPD officers live because they don't like being in the city. Uh, Housing is also cheaper out there, they say. Um, and he said at some point, you know, oh, you know, you can arrest them. Just, you know, don't be too harsh. You know, you just bump their heads against the car when you, you know, put them in the backseat. You know, just make sure you beat them, make sure you kick them. And it's an audience full of cops well, in uniform laughing at this. 
you know, just kind of chuckling along. Oh, it's a joke. Yeah, sure. Why not? But then you see how over the course of the last administration, there were no efforts at from the Department of Justice at holding police departments accountable at, at initiating pattern and practice investigations. In fact, the opposite happened under Attorney General Sessions. He tried to avoid the um, consent decree that the, D that the DOJ had already signed off in Baltimore, Maryland, um, over excessive policing practices there. And, you know, the, you did see examples of cops openly siding with right-wing militias, with neo-Nazis, with far-right activists involved in brawls, street brawls with anti-fascists and counter-protesters throughout the country. And that came to a head during the George Floyd movement um, and around the election on January 6th. But all that kind of figures into it. They're really, unfortunately, um, when that when that essence, when that core of law enforcement is given fuel, it turns into something very nasty that in other societies has led to authoritarian dictatorships. I mean, when law enforcement goes off the rails, that's when you start to see these regimes come about. And it's something that maybe, you know, we should be paying a lot more attention to as a society. Um, and little things like cops who go out and commit noble cause corruption and frame people up because they want to clean up the streets, that leads that's kind of like starts you on that slide downhill you know just slouch towards Gomorrah like that well i'm oh, dying to read the book got right ahead there. Dan. i'm sorry and, and and what i what my my question is and we've seen this on many of these uh uh, meet, uh zooms and 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 on webinar the more corrupt and the more out of control departments are, it seems that they end up getting more money and more power. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the dynamic you're referring to also is um, the, the fact that the police ostensibly are there to stop crime and um when crime rates go up they say give us more money we need to go after this crime wave and when crime rates go down they say look what we're doing is working you need to give us more money um and so they can never quite lose um when you look at the ref the the calls for reform um what's interesting is across the country right with the with the george floyd protests that uh began in 2020 um the idea of uh defunding the police or taking away functions from the police um and decriminalizing um uh a lot of things um that those ideas were able to finally enter the mainstream political discourse for the first time and so you had I, and I, I can speak to my city here but you know a, a number of cities um and counties uh they you know the leadership the city councils the the county administrations the mayors and stuff they made these pledges to you know oh well we really want to reimagine policing we want to um defund policing or we want to civilianize these or those functions um so there were these kind of bold pledges made to reform policing this way but now you know almost three years later what we see actually happened was uh police departments were not defunded um most police departments um thanks to the massive federal and state stimuluses that came out through the corona the, the covid 19 um response by the federal government um a lot of those um payments a, a lot of a lot of those bailout funds ended up being paid to police departments by um the county or city councils um that you know determine the budgets and so police uh police department budgets actually grew for the most part over the past three years um the only good thing that really came out of this in, in an administrative sense is that um there are some policing alternatives that have been stood up in the meantime so again my you know the city i cover oakland the police department got a huge budget increase over the past two to three years. Um, but the public narrative is that they were defunded, which doesn't make sense. Um, 
But what did happen was there's a policing alternative program called Macro. It's these unarmed civilians who ride around in vans and they respond to what police used to respond to as like quality of life things like, um, you know, or crises. Um, so if a person is having an apparent mental health crisis or something, or if a person needs some kind of assistance, police used to show up um, and sometimes police would improperly escalate those situations and it would become violent. Well, now Oakland finally has a team of civilians who show up and they're actually trained to like de-escalate things and help people. Um, and, you know, that's like a multi-million dollar program in the city now. And another thing we have is this Department of Violence Prevention, which uses civilian violence um, prevention workers. These are people who have like deep connections to the community. And so when there's like a shooting or something, they'll identify people who are victims or also um, associated with the, the potential suspects in a shooting. And they'll reach out to those people and they'll like actually try to like help deescalate, you know, a feud or a conflict or something. And that department in Oakland is now funded upwards of $20 million a year, which just uh, five years ago, it didn't even exist. Yeah. So we've gone from zero to like, a you know, 20 plus million dollar budget. Now, again, the OPD budget is like 300 million almost a year. It's like 40 percent of the city's um, general fund budget. It's by far the largest single outlay of the city of Oakland. And Oakland is about like, it, 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 you know, it's about average. It's like, you know, um, I can't speak of San Bernardino, but like, you know, I think most California cities and counties outlay about that much money um, percentage wise to their police departments. And they, they just keep growing. There's the, the promises of actually like shifting our society away from making these huge financial investments in policing hasn't really panned out yet. Yeah. And, and also it's worthwhile to just to, as an ending point, we started writing about the police budget and efforts to shift money away from policing towards intervention services, towards crisis intervention, towards public health approaches to law enforcement in 2012, 2013. That conversation started happening in Oakland nine years ago, almost a decade ago. So it takes, it took an incredible amount of time, energy, and advocacy in this one city of 400 something thousand people to get to this point. And it also took the two cycles of the Black Lives Matters movement, um, an incredible social upheaval. You know, it, it took a lot of time for that to happen. And it's also a very progressive community. It's that sort of thing happens at a much more glacial pace elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, but I'd like to thank Ali and Darwin for, for an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And uh, to California State University of San Bernardino. Uh, thanks very much for hosting this. Thank you, guys. A great, great show. Thank you so much.